My name is Ernest R. Benson, E-R-N-E-S-T-R-B-E-N-S-O-N. Mm -hmm. I was born in Mount Vernon, New York, mm -hmm. raised in Floral Park, New York. When were you born? August 26, 1930. 1930. Tell me about your family background, your parents and your siblings. Ah, my parents were Swedish, and they, my father came over here on a, as a uh, personnel on the Swedish liner and, and back in the 20s, and uh, when the doctor, doctor in New York, he walked off and they never saw him again. <laughs> they emigrated. And my mother was... Uh, Self-immigration, right? <laughs> yeah. My mother was uh, already in this country visiting an aunt. Uh -huh. And she had made other trips to this country besides. From where? From Sweden. Oh, so both of... Both of them came from Sweden. At two but they didn't know each other. They when didn't they... know each other. They oh, met my. in this country. And at a f dance at a firehouse or something like that. In Floral Park. In Floral Park. And uh, then she went back to Sweden. And they corresponded. My father stayed here. I understand they were looking for him in Sweden, too, because <laughs> he never came back with the, <laughs> with the ship he came on. And uh, then she came over, and they were married in, in, uh, in Brooklyn in the first Lutheran church. It was the first... Uh, service in the Swedish church that was, uh, was located there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of that, I was the, the uh, offspring and the first child baptist, baptized in that church. Mm -hmm. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have an, uh, a brother, Ralph. Mm -hmm. He lives in uh, New Hartford, New York. That's yeah. up here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. Family is, is out of that. I have uh, some children. I have uh, my son, Court, and he's uh, in his 40s. I have a, a daughter, Lisa. She's in her 50s. And I have a deceased daughter who was a uh, flight attendant for TWA, and she uh, died at the age of 40, 44, 10 years ago. And that's that's the was extent. it an accident? No, she had multiple cirrhosis. Oh, MS. MS. So she suffered a great deal. Mm. I'm sorry. Um, so what school did you go through? Well, I went through grammar school. Yeah, of course. And then I graduated high school. When was it? I graduated high school in nineteen. Uh, 50, actually. 1950? Yeah. Around May? Uh, no, I was a January graduate, a graduate from the 49th. You know, went from the year 49. The reason for this being, I had, in my sophomore year in a class of 48, I had left school. I went to Sweden to live with my relatives to get to know them. The war had just ended. My grandmother was old. And uh, I received permission to travel from the uh -huh. government. Uh -huh. and I came back a year and a half later, and I did some school over there where I learned to speak the language fluently. Mm -hmm. After that, I came, and we went. I went to school up in Connecticut, a high school there, and there I took uh, ill and had to come back down to Long Island. And there I re-entered my old alma mater, uh, Swanica High School, from which I graduated. So that's the January of 1950. That's it. January, I guess, between 49 and 50. Mm. You speak in Swedish? Yes. So say something about this interview in Swedish. Yeah, take it well the trevligt of all the samtal. Whatever you say. I think it's very, very nice to have this conversation. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. So let's start this conversation, okay? Uh, did you know anything about Korea around the time that you were graduating high school? No, nothing. The school didn't teach anything about Asia? And when I was in grammar school, I used to see in the history books pictures of junks, those ships, 
And I said to myself, I'd love to go there and see these things. However, I never realized that it would actually materialize. Okay, so you didn't know nothing about Korea? Other than uh, there was a peninsula called Chosen. Mm -hmm. It was never referred to as Korea. It was uh, the Chosen Province of China. Province of China? Yeah. Wow. That's what our book said. Mm -hmm. So, um, how did you come to know about the breakout of the Korean War? When did you know and how you know? Was, were you in the street reading the paper or no, I didn't flyers? No, I didn't know at all. I was in my own world as a young man. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that there was, we had a, a depression on and uh, I went out looking for work and I, I uh, saw an ad for the National Cash Register Company. National what? Cash Register Company. Cash Register. And they were looking for an apprentice to start enter the business. They needed one person, and uh, they were to assist in repairing small motors and things like that. Mm -hmm. and I said, I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. So I went there and got online. There must have been 200 people online. But I was confident. I don't know why, but I just knew I was going to get the job, and I did. Uh-huh. And uh, I was serving with the... Uh, was it the, right after the graduation of your high school? Yes, it, it, it wasn't right after. It was I, because I had entered uh, Farmingdale, and I did one semester of college there, that, uh, and it was... It, I could see I was not... It was not for me. It was agricultural, and I was not about to be agricultural. But I was very aware of the dormitory being emptied out from the the drafts of people being drafted to, to, into the Army. And so well, now I, I, I had just registered. So I was concerned about uh, being called up for service. And uh, that's about the beginning when I started to become aware of a war in Korea. Mm -hmm. So have you ever thought that you could be dragged into the Korean War? I didn't think much of it at the time because there was. <laughs> you were twenty years old. Yeah, I was. Two, I was. I was young. <laughs> but evidently, I found out later on, in uh, after I had returned, some angry neighbor had, who was who had some influence with the, the local politicians, had my draft date moved up to get rid, get me out of the neighborhood. Mm. He really disliked me. Whoa. And when I returned, he gave me a hell of a greeting. He says, you're back. I wish they could kill you over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. And the sad part about it is when I, when I got the news, I was going to, you know, after tra basic training, I got the news. So was, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. Drafted when? The exact date. Month. Uh, let me let me just think about this. Uh, it was in, in the, it was ooh, in August. August twelfth. August of uh, fifty one. And army, right? Into the army, yes. Yeah, yeah. And we were reported to Hampstead. To the draft board there, and they took buses to Whitehall Street, New York, where they went through all the physical. Then it was buses to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, where we spent the first couple of nights. Mm -hmm. And that was some experience. <laughs> Tell <laughs> me about it. Well, I got enthusiastic because I thought, well, it's just, you know, I'm going to be in this. I may as well get into it and get involved. And uh, we've had to fall out that early in the morning and uh, of course I did that and I was a pretty big guy and uh, they said we, we, we're here to find assignments for you and uh, we're looking for uh, people to be investigators that Ooh. sounded interesting uh -huh. and uh, <clears throat> G-men to be particular and we're going to anybody who's interested step forward so I did and uh, it was quite a few of us because they're out 
They think, oh, you're too scrawny, you're this, you're that, do 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 do. I got picked. I was very proud. And then they said, all right, this is what you're going to be do doing. You're G-Man. That stands for garbage man, and you're going to investigate every garbage can on the post and make sure it's empty. <laughs> because we were humiliated, but <laughs> we did it. How did you like it? <laughs> <laughs> That only lasted a couple of weeks. Then we were shipped off to basic training, which is at where uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And there we went through. I went through eight weeks of basic training. So, what was your specialty? Well, sign? they decided since my, the line of work I was in before, when I was drafted, was the cash register business. They I got tested, and they, they had two two possible courses for me small arms repair or field wiring and electrical. Uh -huh. And they needed me in field wiring and electrical more than small arms repair. Mm -hmm. So I went to field wiring school at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and then on to pole climbing school. Needless to say, pole climbing school was not to my liking because those telephone poles have been climbed up and down, up and yeah, down by yeah. many classes, and they were... They were barely standing up, <laughs> and I, I did not like heights. Yeah. And uh, me either. <laughs> in I the am, beginning, there was one pole in particular that nobody wanted, and everybody ran for the other poles when they said, "Get, find your poles." I got tripped, and I wound up with this one particular devil pole where the top was cracked, and it would lean like that, okay. and we had to go to the top. And there were exercises we had to perform, but I froze up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just braced that pole, and I would not come down. I just could not move. Big bear and, at and the top were, of the tree. And they were threatening me. They threw stones at me. And the sergeant said, hey, I'm, if I'm coming up to get you, and I said, I'll put this spike in your head, you know, because you have spikes on your shoes. <laughs> and when it got dark, then I climbed down. <laughs> well, how long did you stay there? Up until the sun went down, because I was I, then I couldn't see the ground. So several hours you yes, were up there? Yes, I stayed there. Strong man, huh? Yeah. It was, it was frightening. But after that, I, you know, I managed to force myself, and I, I got through the pole climbing school. Oh. So, so I became a field wireman. Field wireman. And, and uh, on poles and things. From there... I went home for Christmas. 1951. Right. Yeah. Well, this was the winter of, yep. of, you know, 51 and 52. And uh, I told my, I wrote a letter saying that I was going to, getting orders to go to Korea. Oh. And my father read the letter and, and he had a heart attack and died on the spot. So I had to because go Because of the letter you wrote. That's right. He was reading it when I, when he died. And he had just been to the doctor and gotten a clean bill of health. How old was he? Uh, Fifty-two. Fifty-two? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So the Red Cross sent me home, and uh, I, I, they gave me a 30-day leave. And then uh, they said I did not have to go back into the service. But I, I couldn't uh, not go back to the service because then this would have all been for nothing, his dying. Right. Then it would have been, it would have been worse for me. So I said, I've got to go back. I want some payback. You want to have something good came out, coming That's out right. of your Absolutely. father's pass away. Absolutely. And I wanted, I wanted to get back at them over there. Wow. I never... I never heard this kind of story. Oh my goodness! So that's what. Do you I, still keep that letter? No, my mother had it. That uh, it's, I don't have the letter. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh well, boy. I never saw the letter again. What did you write? You said that you're just going to Korea. No, I said, well, we've got orders to go to Korea and going to fight in Korea. Because by then we were totally aware of it. And uh, people who were training us were veterans of Korea, and they told us some pretty hairy stories about their experiences over there. So, oh. 
Can, can you share some of those stories that you heard from the trainers? Well, you know, I've, it was uh, hordes of them, and uh, there were so few of, that, of ours, and there was uh, quite often we they'd lose a lot of people. And those were just, you know, scare stories, I'm sure. And they, they were true. But that didn't matter. Mm -hmm. So what happened to you then? I shipped out. Right? We went, uh, we left, when I left the house, I gave all the money I had to my mother because she had none. And she went on uh, sort of like, relief or something like that. What was your mom's reaction to your decision to continue on this? She, she didn't, uh, it's, just, it's not strange, but she was strong and, and I said to her, I have to do this. And she wasn't going to argue with me. So I have to do this. Besides, my brother was home also. He was younger, two years younger. Anyhow, we shipped out from uh, San Francisco, landed in uh, Tokyo Bay. There was a city there. Yokohama? Yeah. And then uh, we got on a train. We, and the train was, was like a, a bullet train, and it mm -hmm. was sealed. And it went through the, uh, the area where the uh, atomic bomb had landed. Hiroshima. Yeah. And uh, that was, you know, interesting to see. All this, there wasn't any people there. But it was just twisted metal that had been factories and buildings. And from there, we went to Camp Drake. And from Camp Drake, we got a boat to Korea. And we came in and landed in Incheon. Do you remember when? Around? Around April. April you know, of yeah, maybe? at the end of March. Last days of March. And uh, we, we came ashore on landing barges. Now, Inchon had already been taken, and, but we didn't really know that. And uh, you could hear the noise, you know, the uh, shells in the background far off. And uh, the Marines were there, and they were taunting us as we came off those landing crafts. And it was not like you see in the movies. We sat backwards. What? We sat backwards in a landing craft in this manner, like so. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, they hit the beach. I don't know why, but the, 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 door, the front of the landing barge came down, and we rolled off of that like coal off a shovel. Why? I could not explain that. I was only a private nobody. I couldn't explain that. It's not <laughs> like I saw in the movies where they come charging off. But uh, uh, Inchon was already secure, and the, they just were shuttling as fast as they could before the tide went out. Oh my goodness! So anyway, we got on a train, and they, we traveled up to what they call the Repel Depot, which is a replacement depot. Mm -hmm. And we spent the night there. In the morning, they rallied us, and we. <coughs> We were got our assignment. My my buddy, it was I'm still in contact with him. He's in New Jersey. The two of us were assigned to field artillery units, but not the same one. I went with the 31st field, and he went with the 57th field. Where did you go? Where what was the region, the location? Do you remember? Is it Chuncheon? Well, mine was. Uh, I went up to uh, Chuncheon. Chuncheon. Yeah, and he went to wherever his, his location was. So we parted company there. So you said, what? what is the name of the regiment, you said? Oh, I, I was... 31st? It, it was the 31st Field Artillery Battalion. And the 7th 31st... Infant, 7th Infantry Division. 31st Artillery. Field, field Artillery. Field Artillery. 31 FA. Charlie Battery. And 7th Division. Yes, yep. C Battery. 155 howitzers, mm -hmm. the heavy stuff. And then you said that you move around, right? Oh, yeah. To, uh, I was assigned to uh, the detail section where they put people like myself who did not, you know, do anything with the cannons, 
we did the electrical work on the, you know, put the phone wires in for the for a unit or electric, whatever we had to do, operate the radio. You know, we was special mm -hmm. to that. Uh, and they kept us all in place. Some were, tra were tra jeep drivers, some were truck drivers, some were uh, clerk typists. You know, that's what it takes to, to do the internal work of the of the uh, unit. Mm -hmm. Two days later, someone sticks his head, or it was the next day, someone sticks his head in the tent and yells, incoming mail, and everybody runs out of the tent. And I said, well, there's no mail for me. I, they haven't, it hasn't caught up with me yet. So I stayed there, and next thing you know, I found <laughs> artillery shells from the other side came pouring in on us, and that was the incoming mail. So I, <laughs> so I, I got out of there in a hurry, and everybody's up in a cave on the on the, on the reverse slope, yelling, "Come on, run! Come on, run!" <laughs> and from there, I could watch the shells going over and and uh, landing and, and uh, what in the they tent? went to. What? Landing in the tents where you were? No, not not that time, but the landing, and they were trying to reach another unit that was just beyond us. But uh, as soon as that was over with, we packed up and we left now because they had our coordinates. And that day I learned what incoming mail meant. Funny, huh? No one explained it to me. <laughs> did he, Viola, did he talk about this? Lots of times he did. It helped him. It helped heal him to talk about it. So he talked to you about it? Everything. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Your name? I'm Viola. And? Passarella. And? Ernest and I grew up together. Oh. In the same town. We have a picture of us together when we're seven years, we're seven years, seven old. years old. And we met up at our high school reunion. We got back together we again. We both had married. He'd been married twice. And I'd been married and widowed. And we met again. When was at it? Our fiftieth high school reunion. Ah, we're in, we're in our eighties now. He sat down at my table and didn't leave, and we've been together ever since. Ah. Are you from also Sweden? I'm Swedish descent, and Danish. My father's Danish. Oh my goodness! My you, you. And, and yeah, well, that's, our parents knew each other. Hmm. Yeah, we played together as children when we were young. And I have a picture of us hmm. when we were seven years old. What do you think about his fight for a country that he never knew before and coming out so beautifully? You know what happened to Korea, right? After yes. the Korean War, yeah. What do you think about it was that? Sad that huh? It was sad for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. Sad that people were suffering, that they sent a, a young men over and they were getting maimed and hurt when killed, too. So it was sad. We were young. You know, we're the same age. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know him then. Were you aware that he was in Korea? No. No. I, I uh, corresponded with his brother, who went to Korea. Mm -hmm. so you knew I was there. And he was there, yeah. I, I missed the part. You, your brother was there in Korea with you. Not with me. When I was leaving and he was arriving. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and I was, I was it's the same division. We just missed each other. Mm -hmm. So it's tell. Kind of complicated. Okay, so tell me about major uh, locations you were stationed. You were you you were stationing. Where were you? After Chuncheon, where did you go? We, we were in North Korea. Uh, Chongyangni, which is not north of Seoul. Yeah. There, uh, we were attacked there with uh, Chinese borders. And uh, at that time, I, I uh, ex excelled in my, my job as a radio operator. And I was awarded the... Uh, 
Army Commendation Medal for action in that day, in that encounter. Well, what was the, the occasion? Did you it was uh, Chong Yang Ni. Okay. Yeah. What was your action to be recommended? Well, I, I have to backpack. Back, when I first got, you know, involved in uh, locations, I was a private. And all they had to do at those times was menial work, digging, uh, whatever crap needed doing, you were doing it, and I did not like it. <laughs> so I said, there must be a better way. This is not what I came here for. And so I started to look around where you could make some rank. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked around, and uh, I found out they, they needed spotters for the artillery, the FOs, yeah, for the reservists. Yeah. So I got, it, got interested in that, found out what I needed to know, and I said, I'd like to give it a shot. So I did, and it went well. And I FO'd on a several different uh, hills, and every month it seems I got a stripe. And I went, I went up the ranks to become a sergeant in, in a matter of months. Wow. In fact, I was the last sergeant made before the rank was frozen. From private? From private. What, where was it, in Cholwon? No. Was it Chongyang Ni, right? It was Chongyang Ni. Yeah. Yeah. And after that, where did you go? Well, uh, Kumwa Valley. And that was our, our home base. From there, I, I would go out on missions, you know, to locate and uh, wire radio back uh, positions to, so that they could fire artilleries on them. And... Uh, also, I have to credit my, my executive officer, a lieutenant, that uh, he chose me to be his, his uh, number two, which was a radio sergeant, because we were an FO team. And I wondered why he chose me, but it seems that I had uh, qualified in the uh, weapons that I, have a, uh, I was a, a sharpshooter. Right or left-handed, I became a sharpshooter, mm -hmm. and I really worked at of getting that status. So I have uh, I've got a certificate for that, and that's what he wanted. He wanted somebody else to cover his, that could shoot and could cover his back. Mm -hmm. So together we made a good team. He got promoted to company commander of another, a battalion commander of another uh, unit, and uh, that was the last I saw of him. Please describe a typical day in Guma Valley. Tell me the details. Where did you go? What you did? And then if there were any occasion where that you are encountered with the enemies, so on. While I was in Guma Valley, all hell started to break loose, not in the valley itself, but in the Iron Triangle. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I got the call to go up there as a field artillery observer uh, for the 32nd Infantry Regiment, the Polar Bears, which I did, and uh, it was a, uh, it was really a slaughter up there. Was really what? A slaughter. 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 You know, killing. 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 Oh, 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 a big killing field slaughter. up there. Yes. And uh, I've traversed the hill twice. Uh, I got up the top and I had been there just about half a day when we got under attack again. Uh, the lieutenant and I went down to search some bodies for a map or intel. And one of the people that was you know, in, the, in our foxhole stood up on the ridge line taking pictures of us and therefore became a focal point. And they were able to triangulate right on us. Mm -hmm. And the shells came raining down. Well, I, I managed to get up and get back into the foxhole. And uh, so did the lieutenant. And uh, the fellow who was taking the pictures, he kept taking pictures, and he got a full blast right in the face. So he lost his face. 
And, uh, but, you know, he didn't lose his vision. He just got to burn because what they, mortar shells were was white phosphorus. And uh, that just burns. It's, it's, you know, like flame. It just, as long as it has oxygen, it burns. And uh, I had it on my hands and pieces of the, the shrapnel from the casing. So I got the scar right in the ear. And I got the first aid, you know, the aid medic, medic, you know, and they, they, they come over and they patch you up and they says, okay, you're good to go. Go get them, you know. They, this, unless you're taken out in a, in a helicopter or a, on a stretcher, you don't go to the aid station. They patch you up right then and there and you're back on the line again. The next day, I got relieved. And uh, one of my best friends came up and he says, all right, you can go now. I'm, I'm taking over. And uh, my officer at the time said, when, you get, when we get back there, I'll put you in for the Purple Heart. Well, I, he never got back. And the fellow who relieved me, he was in the hospital before I got back. Mm. He, he took a piece of shrapnel and the lieutenant took, took another piece and he expired. So there was no Purple Heart to be gotten. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I wish I had, I had the heart, and other times I, it doesn't matter. It's just yeah. feeling that I've, I've, I, I did something. So I got through the Jeep. He relieved me in the foxhole. I got to the Jeep. The Jeep was all shot up. They had hit it the, on the top of, the, of uh, Jane Russell Hill. There was a trail that the engineers had dug up there and trying. Uh, Jane Russell Hill was a major hill, a very bloody hill. And got in the, the Jeep. It, would, it couldn't be started. And uh, it, they had been shot full of holes, but they hadn't shot out the tires. And so it was three officers and myself. We, uh, I got behind the wheel. They pushed the Jeep out, out of the, the hiding space, and it's all down the mountain. I drove it down. And uh, we got towed back to our home base, and uh, that was it. Then I went to a rest, a rest center. Another occasion? When was it, actually? When were you actually wounded oh, on your hands? In October 26, 19... October 26? 1952. I had it also on the back of my hand. Uh-huh. It's... it's, it's Little, they're like little flaming pellets that go in the back of your hand. And I also covered my face with the hand and, and my rifle butt. Mm. So yeah. you were almost ready to go back to home? <laughs> no, no, I was unconscious. Oh. I re when I re revived, someone was stuffing a rag down my throat, and I never did know who that was or why. It was fingers in my mouth stuffing a rag down. I don't know who it was. Oh, when I started to come to, that person disappeared. Because sergeants were never popular anyway. So what happened after that? Well, that's when we, you know, we went down. And uh, that's what, what, what happened there. Any other occasion where you really were in danger to lose yeah. your life? Yeah, when we took when we came under fire at Chongyang Li, I was in the, my tent, and uh, it is after the Kumha Valley again. Pardon? It is. A, it was it after the Kumha Valley. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. so uh, you went no, back it, to Chongyang Li? No, it was before the uh, before. Kumha, okay. Yeah, before. Right. I was in the tent, and I could front of the flap was open. It was a squad tent. We had sandbags up about that high or on the sides so that you could lay on the floor if something happened. Mm -hmm. There was no floor, it was dirt. And all of a sudden the rounds came in and uh, we got, got a hit on the tent. And I crawled out of there on my belly and I got to headquarters, you know, the, the, the command post. And uh, there was no communications lines left open. So one of my, one of my men ran a, a corporal suck Sokolowski, his name was, he ran a line to down the road and as far as he could run with it, got it to over to headquarters. Meanwhile, I went out and rescued the commander's jeep, 
which had the shortwave radio in it, and I stayed on the radio while it exposed, totally exposed, maintaining communication at all times with uh, everything that was coming down. The camp was a disaster, <laughs> and I took so, a lot of pictures of that after it was over. You had a camera with you? Yeah, at that, oh. after it was over, I, I grabbed my camera and I started taking some pictures of it. I took a picture of my tent from the inside. It looked like the starlight roof. It was so full of holes. <laughs> um, let me ask you about the soft side of this service, your service. How much were you paid? Oh, as a sergeant. I, at, at the beginning, it was like $80 a month, but as a sergeant, I got $205 a month. And that was 200 what? $205 a month. Wow, yeah, that's... I did, I did, by that time, she had gone home to Sweden. So you send those money to your? No, no, I, I, I uh, sent money orders home to to be saved. Okay. You know, to be banked. You and didn't spend anything while you were in Korea. Yes, I did. They they had what they call a PX truck came around. Yes, yes. And I bought a, a very expensive wristwatch, and I bought a twelve gauge shotgun. <laughs> During the war? During the war. They, they had Did you good. need another gun? Brent, Brent, well, no, I mailed it home eventually, but I thought to myself, maybe I should hang on to this because it's a good scatter gun. It's, you know, for close work. But then I said, no, it's brand new. It's full of cosmoline. It's never been used. It's in a box. I'm going to mail it home, which I did. Any reason you bought that expensive watch? I always wanted one. Huh? I always wanted a good watch. I, I never had a good watch. Now I have, thanks to this wonderful lady, I have this one. Wedding? She bought me for my birthday. Oh. And that's, that's one of the, my pride and joy. <laughs> Where did you sleep in Kuma Valley? Did you stay in tent or? In Kuma? No, we had a bunker. Bunker. Bunker dug into the side of the hill. Tell me about this life inside of the bunker. How many were there and smelly as? Well, it was, it was smelly, yeah, but you got used to it because, you know, it becomes a way of life. Yeah, we are the man. And uh, it was cold, but, I, you know, you learn how to keep warm. The warm air is always at the top, so I always took a top, top bunk. Because down you closer sergeant. to the floor, the colder the air is, and little things like that. We had a uh, pot belly stove that was fueled with gasoline. There was a risk involved, but it was heat. And uh, we had a we had a, a, a sergeant in charge. Uh, uh, he was a mass, uh, not a master sergeant, a sergeant first class. He was in charge of the whole operation. I was coming. Uh, I was a communications sergeant, but they have more jobs for you than just being the, you know, that's my MOS as communications mm -hmm. sergeant. They also made me the, uh, the rat sergeant, and I'll explain that. Also the TI and E tra uh, training information and education. I would re get uh, the, the news every week and, and keep the troops up to uh, speed as to what was going on in Korea, the war and the peace talks and the, all the news I could gather from Stars and Stripes, oh. and I would re report that. I'd read it to the to the troops. As Rat Sergeant, I organized some uh, Korean uh, KFC workers to build rat traps out of shell casings and a piece of wood, and we put uh, poison in them and we hid them in areas of the of the tent where more than likely we would have the visitors of the furry kind because hemorrhagic fever was pretty heavy over oh. there. And uh, I managed to con keep it under control and uh, we had no incidents and we got rid of the rats mostly because they would eat it and then go down to the... So I was a celebrated rat sergeant. <laughs> hmm. What did you eat in the tent? What Did you have a hot meal or situation? Yes, yes we had a hot meal. Peace talks were going on. And they had rigged the tent, and they had made some t tables uh, out of ammo uh, crates and boxes, and they and we, everybody ate in the tent. Uh, the sergeants had their, their own tent, 
and they had the people there that would bring the tray to you. You didn't have to go through the line. You just so what uh, scrambled so eggs. So it, it was pretty pretty nice. So we had a lot of chop meats. Yeah, every day, every day there was some some other form of chop meat. You know, Salisbury steak, hamburger, meatballs, meat sauce, things like that, and rice. Oh, did we eat rice? You like rice? I like rice. <laughs> Some people don't like rice that much. I'm never going to eat rice again. I can't stand it. Well, so it wasn't not too bad about the meals, right? No, the food was good. Uh -huh. food was good. We also had the sea rations. They were from World War II. And some of the things in those sea ration cans, they were, they were something else. But there were some good ones. That pork sausages and greasy, greasy pork sausage or, or pork patties, they were... Poof. But the beans were good, and some of the other things, the vegetable soups. And then there was a block of chocolate that had been there so long it started to turn with like white crust on it, hard as a rock. But that was a really good thing because you could gnaw on it like a rat whenever you, got, you needed energy. Mm -hmm. you, you could never completely consume this thing. You could just scratch it with your teeth. Uh -huh. So that was good. And, of course, there was a pack of cigarettes in every one. And they said, with a slogan on it, Lucky Strike Green has gone to war, mm -hmm. which was the slogan from World War II. Lucky Strike, I know the brand. Yeah, Lucky yeah. Strike Green, because it wasn't a red patch on it anymore. It was a yeah. green patch, because that was the uniform color. <laughs> and they were from the 1940s. <laughs> so they were pretty stale. Yeah. And a sheet of toilet paper came with it. Uh -huh. One sheet. One sheet? One sheet. <laughs> so how did you deal with the uh, rest of your... Well, I could show you. I mean, this, if I had a sheet of paper, I could show you exactly how you deal with it. Let's see. <laughs> okay. This, this, say this is a Don't tear of, down. This is a piece of toilet paper. Hold on, paper. hold on. Let me refocus. That's it. So you would take and you fold it into fours like so, yeah, and you like that, and then you tear this corner out. Yeah, don't Look. don't tear it, don't tear it. Oh, I just did. Oh, just leave it. Okay. And then, and then you open it up. Yeah. Right, and you <laughs> insert your finger through this. <laughs> Now this piece that you tore out is very important because after you. Like that, you use that little piece to clean under your fingernails. <laughs> Have you heard about it? Yes? Yeah. I've told him about it. <laughs> <laughs> Demoed it. <laughs> well, I guess. You had to do what you had to do. Yeah, we had to do what we did. Oh. That got to be a standard joke. What is it? That with this one sheet of toilet paper, because no one hardly ever did it. Huh. We had toilet paper. But every time we opened up the can, everybody did the demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> did you write back to your mom? Yes, I wrote to her. What I had a girlfriend back home I wrote to at the time. What did you write? What I was doing, little nice things. We, you know, we were going together before I got drafted. And uh, she your was, girlfriend. Yeah, and she was waiting for me when I got home. We even got engaged. Very nice. But it didn't go through. Oh. <laughs> so that was that. Did you think about your father? while you were in Korea, who passed away because of the... What I had written? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did occasionally, but, I, you know, some, it, would, it, I'd, it was... I would, they have this expression, sweet, sorry me. That was, it, it would they, uh, grieve me too much to do that. Yeah. Um... So when did you leave Korea? May 3rd, 1953. It was just before that last push on, on Pork Chop Hill, and they were getting me ready for it. Mm -hmm.
when suddenly my name came up on the rotation list and I was one happy camper. <laughs> I stayed in the bunker. I'm not going out anymore. <laughs> you want to be alive. That's home. right. I don't want to be listed as the last one. So tell me about it. What it how do you put all this sort of uh, happenings to you. you. You never imagined that you would be in Korea. Your father died of your letter that you headed to Korea. You were participating in the very extensive battle and you're coming back. How do you put these things to get into a perspective? Well, there's, there's things that I, I, I don't uh, I don't really talk about. And uh, these are things that you witness uh, through the course of the war. Uh, on, say, for instance, the Battle of Jane Russell Hill, I, I went down the hill t- to a collecting sp- uh, spot down at, at the uh, base of the hill that, that was still under fire. And there were all the dead who were piled up, the dead ch- Chinese. And they were piled up like logs along the side of the road. Oh. And the Americans were laid on individual stretchers. And, of course, they were not covered with blankets or anything like that because there just wasn't anything to cover them with. They were all in the rigor mortis set in, in the grotesque positions and expressions. And suddenly I thought I'd recognize somebody I knew. And I went over there, and I was greatly relieved it wasn't. I felt sorry. I, was, I thought to myself, it's very fortunate his mother can't see him like this. And while I was there, a, a truck pulled up, a deuce and a half, and unloaded replacements. And these young <laughs> privates, they jumped off the back of the truck with their new clothes on and their duffel bag. And they told them, well, you wouldn't need your duffel bag to run back on the truck. Where you're going, all you're going to need is your rifle. And these, these guys, their eyes lit up. And then they saw the bodies laid out, and they started to cry. And when they sat down on the ground, and uh, they were ordered to stand, and two of them stood, shaking, and one just lost it. He couldn't. He couldn't get up off the ground. Yeah, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going. So they, you know, they when when they first got off, they said, "Where, where are we going?" And I said, well, "You're going to." Re-. I didn't say. That. The man, he was a little sadistic, that was doing a pickup. He said, well, you're replacing these guys over here. And he points to all those dead Americans. Yeah. And meanwhile, they're loading the, all these dead Chinese onto the truck like logs to be taken down to where they ever they're going to dispose of them. So th- this was, you know, this was pretty grotesque to see. Plus, there was a lot of, you know, where, where artillery shells had landed in foxholes, there was body parts. And these things were, they, they were just a bit much. So, with that comes post-traumatic stress disorder. You have it? Yeah. I'm work, it's working out now. What do you mean, working out? Well, when I first got back, I, I, you know, I wanted to step back into my role that, that I had before I was drafted, I wanted to go back to the, the job I had. I wanted to go back to where I lived, and I, I wanted to go back to the girl I was with. In the, in the first six months, I, I got all those three things, but then the engagement went south when she decided she, was, uh, 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 she wasn't that keen on it. And uh, how, how it happened? You, did you reveal the symptoms of PTSD, that's why? No, I, all of a sudden, that it, I couldn't, she was not home, or she was there, or she wasn't there on a weeknight. So I, I went and I parked outside the, near her house, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, she comes home with someone else. So I asked for an explanation. She passed me the engagement ring, and that was the end of it. Huh. She didn't want to be engaged anymore. She was. She was wanted to play the field. So you got to take your losses. You take your losses. It wasn't meant to be. But two out of three isn't bad. 
So I got the job back that I loved, and I lived where, where I wanted to live, and uh, eventually got married. It was not a great marriage. And uh, that's about it. I, I, I became an alcoholic. Hmm. But I only drank during... After Since when? What, since you returned from Korea, yeah. Yeah, was well, it because of the sufferings? No, that wasn't really it. what it was. Is they they gave us alcohol as a, as a treatment for the when you come down, uh, you know, off a, a skirmish or something. Then you in Korea, yeah, and you're you know you're uptight or something to that effect. I got four bottles of bourbon a, a, a month, a case of beer, and a case of soda, which I shared with my troops. And the, the liquor was uh, wasn't free. It was four dollars for a bottle of. Oh, you had bottle. to buy. Uh, yeah, well, it, it was. You had the privilege of buying it. Privilege of buying it. Yes. Yeah, four dollars was not a lot of money. Okay. For for a hundred proof of old granddad bourbon or something like that. Agreed. Top top of top shelf, you know. But anyway, we got to consume it. And plus, that we had a, a, a sergeant first class there who was. Uh, he was like the the grand master of this stuff, you know. He really got everybody drinking with him. Oh. Uh, he was nasty. He was, he was. Was it endemic like everybody that they were kind of encouraged to drink or forced to drink? Not forced. Encouraged. If they wanted to, nobody made you do it. It's, it's just that you'd find relief if you know what I'm saying. Oh, I need a drink, you know. When did you find that you have a PTSD? Well, I got tested by the by the the, the, the VA in Northport. When? <sighs> well, more than that. More than that. Yeah, well, about 15, 14 years ago. So about two thousand. Yeah. But wasn't didn't well, were you not suffered from PTSD? I was functional. I was very functional. I had a good job. I, I you know, I, I was uh, very excellent at my work. It was after five o'clock, I was off to the bar, cocktail lounge, and I would drink a bottle of night. And did you have a nightmare? I I had a few. So then, what did, what was your PTSD symptom? Well, uh, I could get very very hostile. In fact, uh, the last the last time I had the simple, I was 72 years old, and I took some guy out in the supermarket. He he pressed the right buttons, and you know they say you see red. Well, I didn't see red. I just saw white, blazing white. It was like a big white sheet in front of me, and I lashed out. And you get such an adrenaline rush, you have super strength. Other than PTSD, I, I was never that seriously injured. I had frostbite in my feet, so it was difficulty working, but, uh, walking, but it really didn't start to become a problem until I started to get old, so much, much older. I have what they call charcut foot. What is that? That's when your feet start to disassemble the bones in them, and they flatten out like pancakes, and they get longer and wider. Oh. So I went from a from a size 13 to size 15 now. Oh, oh. that's and why I have so to have custom made shoes. Oh. Have you been back to Korea? No, I haven't. Okay. Do you know what happened to Korea after you left? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I, I kept you know busy with the. Uh, what, what goes on, especially up at the M uh, DMZ. And uh, there's been quite a few incidents up there, and at least 16,000 Americans have been killed up there yet. I'm talking about Korea's economic development and, and democracy. What do you uh, well, I've been, you know, watching the pro progress of the of the rebuilding of Korea. It's absolutely amazing. I think they're making a great car now. The Kia is really smart looking. You own Kia? No. <laughs> I bought that Chevy van. Mm -hmm. 
that's a handicapped man. Right. But uh, this year, I'm noticing a big difference as the cars are larger and they're better looking and they seem to have a lot more appointments. And they're, really, they're coming into their own now. Yeah. But uh, earlier they were just another car, but now they're, they're not another car. Now I, they're at a stage I would consider buying one. Do you have grandchildren or great-grandchildren? I have grandchildren. What age? I have two granddaughters, one 17, 18, and I have a grandson who is 14. Huh. So 17, 18, they are in high school. One has graduated. Oh. The 18-year-old is out. What's she doing? <laughs> well, that's my son's children, and uh, she, is, she is, has a, a job in an office. She's going to uh, college nights for a free time. Okay. Um, I mentioned about Youth Corps, the descendant organization that organized last year to keep the legacy of the Korean War veterans. Do you remember? I talked about yes, it in the yes, morning. Yes, yes, uh, that interested me. Yeah, so please, uh, would you be willing to talk to them? I would. I, I, my grandson, I'm sure, would be interested. Mm -hmm. How about granddaughter in uh, the high school? No? They're, they're into boys. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what girls are. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the, he, my, my grandson is a straight-A student. He lives on Martha's Vineyard up in Massachusetts. Oh, please, please invite him. And... Uh, He's going to England on a class trip this year. What's he doing now? He's going to go to England. No, no, no. He finished with the school, right? No, he's 14. Oh, okay. Over the summer he's going to go to England. He's oh. going to go up there for, to England for a couple of weeks as a class trip with, you know, exchange students. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I don't know how many st other children he'll be going with, but he's going and uh, stay with the family there. I learned about England and then come back. Yeah. And, uh, so he's 14. Yeah. So he's in the middle school. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe he's too young to, to join. Well, me. he's brighter than most. Oh, just, just in case, please ask him to yeah. contact me, okay? He's uh, very into computers. He wants, when he grows up, he wants to design computer games. Huh. And his, his grades are up there, and there's the A's. He's a mathematician. Very good. Ask him to contact me, please. You know, this is uh, three days, three nights and four days in Washington, D.C. Uh, my foundation cover every expenses except half of the transportation. So where, where is it located? At Martha's Vineyard. Oh, that's just off the coast of Massachusetts. I know, but the Cape Cod. Yeah, yep. it's, but it's out in the water completely. Yep, yep, yep. He was born there. So, for example, he driving from there to Washington, D.C. Well, he don't drive. <laughs> He's 14. <laughs> oh, yeah, that. right, 14, I'm sorry. If he, whatever. He would fly. Half of the, the flight ticket will be reimbursed by the foundation. Yeah. And you can chip several dollars to to his ticket and everything else is covered except yeah, would, the registration fee of fifty dollars yeah i would pay his way excellent sure i'd pay his half yeah so i've done that before for uh, trips and things like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he went to uh some college for for uh, two weeks for uh, computer studies very good and i paid for that so, tell me, what is Korea to you? It was a memorable experience to me. It was like a coming of age. You went in a boy, I looked like a boy, I came out, I, don't, I didn't look the same. I was a man. You grew up. Right. And yet... Socially, I was two years behind when I got back, and it was trying to catch up that was difficult. I had to resolve social issues. They, didn't, they weren't playing the same songs. They didn't do the same dance. They didn't wear the same clothes. I had to reinvent myself.
And I did. That's good. So tell me about your thoughts on the legacy of the Korean War and the Korean War veterans. How do you want to describe the legacy of your own? Well, whenever, you know, you see how it's all rebuilt it from the, when, you, when I look at my album, which was rarely, but when I do, I have pictures I've taken in Seoul where there's, there doesn't seem to be many walls standing. Just was rubble, block after block of bricks and, and uh, huts made, made of beer cans and, and, and <laughs> all kinds of things like that. And then you see how it is today. I said to myself, that's, uh, that, you know, I, uh, I felt like I was part of it. I, was, I had, I contributed. Yep. It's just like you, you give them the land and they, and they will farm it. They will plant it. They will build on it. So we gave them back their land. As I mentioned in the dinner, over the dinner. I'm not, I, I don't know how I can figure out what I would do and what I would be without your fight during the Korean War. It gives you a chance. I feel like I, I contributed something to that. I took a chance to, I they could have died. That's why I think, uh, all the Korean people never forget to thank you. Oh, they do. The Korean War veterans. We have large com Korean communities on Long Island and, and in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and especially in Flushing. And uh, sometimes I find a, a, a note on my windshield, thank you for saving my country. I get all choked up. Mm. That's why it, it was a very important war, but it's been forgotten. Oh, uh, it's... In so important when people ask about it as if it was the first attempt of communism to spread exactly in the in the in the east and the, the plan was to take over japan and then spread communism all the way around stalin was dead and and if and the only reason that the, the with the war actually got us involved is when it came up to a vote at the u.n the russians were absent on a hissy fit yeah and uh they weren't there to veto it, which was their big blunder. But it was your gain and our gain. Yes. And that we stopped it. We nipped it in the bud. And since then, the Berlin Wall has come down. Russia's states have disassembled. Communism is on its way out. There's only a couple of holdouts, and we know who they are. Yeah. It was a very, very important war. It actually shaped the, every aspect of whole people in the world into a two different poles, right. communist and capitalist free right. country. Right? It, that's exactly the point yeah. I make. So if we hadn't, you'd be marching to a different drummer today. Exactly. Anything that you want to add to this interview? No, it, you know, it, it, it really bothered me when I started to hear about the things being said, like the Forgotten War. That really annoyed me. Then I, I, I bought a baseball cap that said Korean War veteran, and I, I promised myself I'd wear that every day for the rest of my life, and I've been doing just that. Hmm. And if I want to read everywhere I go, people know me by that hat. And, and, uh, and my license plate. What is it? How? What? What is it? Korean War veteran, uh -huh. 31st Field. This one that you see here, I got from the Korean ambassador mm -hmm. when he was touring, uh, going through the different chapters. Last year. This was from last year. In fact, it's, uh, I've got a picture of it on my on my cell phone. This uh, my shooting expertise. Is. Uh, what else have I got here? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you.